This video will look at the urinary system and its structure and function in keeping you in good health and homeostasis. The urinary system is one part of a larger organization of body functions known as the excretory system. And in the excretory system, this is the various processes that collect all of the wastes that are produced by cells as they're going about their daily functions and removes those wastes from the body. Because we need to get rid of these waste products. These waste products, if they stuck around, would be building up inside you and can make you sick. Many of them are quite toxic. As we saw in the digestive system disorders, the genetic disorder PKU, the buildup of a, a toxic product, an amino acid that the body can't break down, leads to neurological damage and a loss of function. So it's pretty important that we have a way to get rid of waste products, to take out the trash, as it were. What are the various kinds of waste, then, that are taken out in the excretory system? Well, we have waste that's coming from gases. Carbon dioxide is produced in cellular respiration, and so, of course, it is removed through your respiratory system. We haven't talked about that system yet, but we'll get to it. Solid waste, which refers to things that you can't digest from your food, so indigestible food components, are taken out through your digestive system. It goes in one end of your food tube, and then what we can't digest comes out the other end. But today I want to talk about water-soluble waste, things that dissolve in water. And these are various waste products of metabolism, all those chemical reactions that keep you alive and keep you in homeostasis. And this is what your urinary system is removing. A key example of a substance that your urinary system gets rid of is urea, which comes from, as we digest proteins and break them down, especially if we're taking those proteins and using them as a source of energy, as a source of calories, we have urea produced, which is a chemical that you want to move out of your body because too much of it is a problem. The urinary system really only has one functional organ, and that is your kidney. So the kidneys are the, the, the one organ. Everything else is just storage and transport. Kidneys jobs are to maintain homeostasis throughout the whole body by controlling what's in the fluid that's outside of your cells. So any kind of fluid that is moving through your body, so that would include your blood because that's outside of body cells, the lymph, the fluid that's moving through the lymphatic system, the lymph nodes, um, there's just a lot of liquid in between cells either as well. So all of that is under the control of the kidneys. Basically, they do their job by filtering the blood. They take a little bit of the blood every time it's passing through your arteries and veins and purify it, remove those metabolic wastes, mix the wastes with just the right amount of water, and throw in a few electrolytes, things like sodium and chloride and potassium, to form urine. The kidneys are their primary job is to make urine, but also they're involved in producing other substances that are involved in other key processes. For example, it's your kidneys that kind of ramp up red blood cell production. So they produce a hormone that make, it triggers your body to make more red blood cells when it's needed. And they also produce an enzyme that's pretty important in controlling blood pressure. So they're not just about urine. Incidentally, they also help activate vitamin D so it can do the job that it needs to help your bones stay strong along with the many other roles that vitamin D plays. So along with the kidneys, then we have, a, we have several transporting and storage structures that are all part of the urinary system. So you can see from this diagram that urine flows from the kidneys into these narrow tubes. And there's one from each kidney. The tubes are called the ureters. We have a lot of things that start with U in the urinary system. The ureters end at the urinary bladder, which is really just a sac of muscle that stores urine. And then the urine moves from the bladder to outside the body through another tube called the urethra. 
I forgot to mention when I was talking about the ureters that the the kidneys, or the drops of urine, I mean, that are passing from the kidneys down the ureters are being pushed along by peristalsis. And that is that muscle contraction that is used in your esophagus to move your food from your mouth as you swallow it down to your stomach. That same type of a wave of a muscle contraction that's pushing everything down is happening in your ureters. So just as you could swallow a sandwich standing on your head, Standing on your head, urine could still make its way from your kidney to your bladder because it's a muscle contraction that does it. Gravity certainly helps, but it's peristalsis that makes it possible. So I know you have experienced life with a bladder, and when your bladder is full enough that the walls are being stretched, there are st what's known as stretch receptors in your um, the, the muscular wall of the bladder. And so when they get stretched, the signal goes to your brain to say, oh, we've got a collection of urine down here. When it is full enough, when you decide it's time to go visit the bathroom, then there is actually a muscle in the bladder wall that will contract and helped by muscles in your abdomen and muscles of the pelvic floor, which are underneath the bladder, they all contract to push the urine out while other things relax, such as the muscles of your diaphragm and your chest wall. There also are various sphincter muscles, again, like in your digestive system, they are circular muscles that will open and close tubes to allow substances through them. So there would be a sphincter down here on, you know, as um, the urine is going from the, to hold urine in the bladder. And so when it's time for it to exit the bladder and leave the body, that external urethra sphincter muscle is going to relax so that things can go out. Your bladder can hold about 600 milliliters or sometimes even more, but you start to feel the need to go that there's something in there I might need to think about the bathroom at some point after about 150 milliliters and you get a stronger urge after about 300 milliliters. You can train your body to hold it a little bit longer, but you really don't want to push that too much um, because you can then cause pain by having a bladder that's overstretched. So what exactly do the kidneys do? How does this all work? Well, basically every drop of blood is traveling through your kidneys about 300 times a day. If the blood only did it once and we added it up, that would be about 45 gallons, which is pretty incredible because you only have a few pints in your blood of traveling through, not gallons for sure. The kidneys, the, the functional unit inside the kidney is a structure called a nephron which are what actually do the removing of waste from the blood and putting together the water and the other stuff that's needed to produce urine. You'll see coming into the kidney in this diagram here on the left, we have the renal artery. So that would be the blood vessel bringing the blood away from the heart and to the body cells. So it's entering in from the renal artery. It will go through the kidney and, and you know deal with all of the nephrons in the kidney itself, and then after that blood has been filtered, it will exit through the renal vein. The fact that there really is just one major artery and one major vein connected to each kidney is why it is, relatively speaking, easy to transplant a kidney, and kidneys were the first organ to be transplanted. The urine itself, as it is made, will collect into this sort of central area, it's actually called the renal pelvis, and drip down in there slowly, tiny, tiny drops at a time, until we have enough to travel down the ureter heading to the bladder. There are four main steps in producing urine, and this structure over here on the right is just sort of an illustration of a nephron blown up greatly. So blood is going to be coming in, the artery is going to be coming in and eventually forming capillaries, little tiny blood vessels that are all going to fill up this section here. It's called the glomerular, I can't even talk that today, Bowman's capsule. That's the other word for it. Um, and that's where the blood will move from the, the 
um, not the blood, but the plasma, the stuff that is not red blood cells, but all that liquid that the red blood cells are sitting in will actually move into this collecting tube that becomes the nephron. So it's kind of like when you make spaghetti and you have the spaghetti in the water and then you pour the whole thing into a colander to filter out the water but save the spaghetti. Well, this is what's happening at filtration. We're filtering out the plasma, that's the part that's not the blood cells, and saving it, saving the blood cells. So the plasma is what's being sent into the nephrons, the part of blood that's much more water-based, but it has all sorts of stuff dissolved in it, and your kidney is sorting through all those things that's dissolved and sort them out, which ones we keep, which ones we send back, which ones get sent on to out of the body. So that next step is reabsorption, where the useful nutrients are reabsorbed. So if there's a little bit of glucose there in the plasma, the body does not want to give that away. That is a source of energy, and so it will be reabsorbed. And a certain amount of sodium and other ions are reabsorbed. Amino acids, very important in building proteins. You don't ever want them to go out in the urine and then other substances like vitamins or water that shouldn't be released. Remember, you make about, as we talked about in the digestive system, you make almost two liters of, of gastric juices every day, and most of those get reabsorbed in the digestive system, but some of that will be reabsorbed as the blood plasma passes through the kidneys. Then the kidneys are involved in balancing things because they're involved in homeostasis and maintaining the right combination of substances in the fluid inside your body. So sometimes things need to be added. So other things have to be put in by a process known as secretion. You also, water can go in and out depending upon what water balance you're in. And then finally, there is excretion where the urine is sent off to the bladder. So I know this diagram is really small, but it does list some of the things of where they go in and out. So these arrows pointing out, this would be reabsorption, heading back into the body. So we see listed in this first box, box things like glucose and amino acids, various vitamins or um, uric acid or the list of chemicals on the right are things of sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, water. So those are all being reabsorbed. And then as the plasma goes down through this very, very convoluted tubule that's the nephron, at some point we have things that are going to be added to it. So kind of down at this bottom part here, we see some urea going in. And then over here on the other side, we're seeing we're adding some hydrogen and some potassium and some ammonia. So these are all substances that are being secreted. They're being put into the urine coming from the body as this nephron goes about its very business. And then this larger tube that it ends up at the end is the collecting duct, and that's going to be heading its way to the center of the kidney where all the urine gets put together and then eventually drips its way down to the bladder. So if you've gone to the doctor's office, you might have had to pee in a cup for some reason. And so there's a few things that, th that they are looking for. Your normal urine will not contain any glucose or any protein because those are very valuable nutrients and your body does not want to throw them out. And urine is a throwing out system. So if there is glucose present, then that is kind of a key that diabetes is going on. Or if there's protein present, then the kidneys themselves are really not functioning well. Perhaps there's been kidney damage due to high blood pressure or some other dis disease state going on. And so these are warning signs. There shouldn't be anything, it, there shouldn't be any um, glucose or protein in the urine. And those are things that are often looked for in urine tests at the doctor's office. The color of your urine is also important because that is telling you how much water is being reabsorbed. This will be greatly dependent on your internal fluid balance. For example, on a hot day, you're going to be sweating a lot. And if you have a little bit to drink, then all of the water is going to be reabsorbed so that you would not produce very much urine and it would be a darker color. But if it's a cooler day or sometime in a situation where you're not sweating and you've got a lot to drink then less water will need to be reabsorbed. It can, you've got too much you've got excess in your situation and then you will have more urine produced and it'll have a lighter color. Generally, the lighter color is what you wanna go for. So if you look on this little chart, these top three colors are known as the hydrated state, that you have enough water in you. 
but as they get darker yellow even down, this is pretty desperate if it gets that color, um, you are dehydrated. You are low in water so much that there wasn't enough extra water available in your body to dilute out these wastes. And so your urine is really very, very high in the waste products and very low in water, which can lead to other problems, which we'll get to in a minute. So it is important to drink. There are a number of recommendations, whether exactly eight cups of water or, you know, your ounces, half of your weight in ounces. Um, I mean, those are general guidelines, but you do want to drink so that you're given off a pale color urine. When you go to the bathroom, dark yellow is not a good idea. So there's two common disorders of the urinary system I want to talk about. The first one is a urinary tract infection, which is also known as a UTI. And in this case, the back, there is bacteria that enters the urethra, which is the tube from the bladder to the outside. And the flow should always be from the bladder to the outside. But bacteria sometimes go from the outside into the bladder. And so then they take up residence inside the bladder, bladder and cause an infection. They can even travel up the ureters and get to the kidneys, which is much more serious. It is more common to see urinary tract infections in women because they just have a shorter urethra. It's only a couple tiny parts of an inch long because the bladder is much closer to the outside. There's not a long urethra like males have with the penis. A bladder infection is typically diagnosed because someone is experiencing pain with urination and the urine itself looks cloudy because the um, various white blood cells that have given their lives to try to combat this infection will be then dead and collecting in the urine. If the infection gets up to your kidneys, then the symptoms will be much more serious. Um, fever and vomiting are possible, back pain, never-ending back pain um, is also a common symptom, and this requires more direct medical intervention. In both cases, antibiotics are generally prescribed, but you might need more heavy-duty ones to take care of a kidney infection. And then kidney stones are another common problem of the urinary tract. And in a kidney stone, as you think about if you don't have enough water and you're creating a very concentrated urine, well, some of those waste products actually form crystals. They form solid particles in those urine collection areas inside the kidney itself or maybe down the ureters or in the bladder. And we have an illustration. This is a metric ruler, so each one of these numbers are going to represent one centimeter. But you can see kidney stones might be very, very small, but they can be ridiculously large as well. The small ones can pass out of the body without any medical intervention, but the larger ones probably are going to require surgery. Kidney stones are, causing, are very painful. They cause quite a bit of pain as they move their way through the urinary tract. Um, typically, the smaller ones can be kind of pushed out by consuming lots of fluids. Often people are given pain medication to just wait they might not be asked to collect their urine in a filter so that you can tell when the kidney stone has been passed. My husband has had several kidney stones, so I've personally seen what he has gone through, and it certainly does not look like something very pleasant. Um, with these very, very large ones, doctors can try to break them up now with ultrasonic vibrations, but certainly in some cases they might have to require surgery to go out there and remove them. So you can see that they come in a variety of sizes, and certainly these big ones with these jagged edges look very, very painful, don't you think? So just in summary, the urinary system is what's removing water-soluble metabolic wastes, things that can dissolve in water, because urine is basically water. You are basically water. Two-thirds of your weight is water. Kidneys are always filtering the blood. They are always working. That's why if your kidneys shut down, you will die within a few days, or you have to start dialysis and go on dialysis every two to three days because when your kidneys are not there, the toxins start to build up very quickly, and you can, you can feel in a couple days that you are, are not well. The bladder is really just storage. It, um, it doesn't have a real strong role in the urinary system. It doesn't filter anything. It just collects the urine. 
And realize you have two kidneys, so it is possible that you could be a live donor and give away one of your kidneys to save someone's life. Certainly we've talked in class how being a donor after death is something you can put on your driver's license. But when it comes to kidneys, you can actually be a donor while you're still alive because you do have two, but you can survive with just one. So if a situation happens that you have a family member or a close friend, you could donate a kidney and help them stay alive. Okay, so that finishes our overview of the urinary system.